Kia ora, Tato. Welcome everybody to this uh, session. And I think uh, we've had a lot of fun today. It's all about political advocacy and how to uh, engage MPs for political and resources. We have two wonderful uh, MPs joining us today. And I'll introduce them very shortly. But first up, who does have a question? Who's been thinking about it? Okay, that's fantastic. How we're going to run this is uh, we've got a pre prepared question. We're going to start with that first. So I want to introduce um, this wonderful panel now, and being politicians, we've decided we can't have a favoritism today. So I'm going to introduce them by name order, alphabetical by first name. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure this uh, is difficult, so you won't know where my political leaders are. Uh, and we have Claudette Hothi, from the National MP, Kevin Hay from the Green Party, of course, and Lisa Ward from the Labour Party. So each of them are now going to give a little bit of an introduction themselves, uh, and then we'll get into the actual discussion. Fantastic, so for that, please. Uh, to acknowledge my parliamentary colleagues for that, and your son. 
Um, and lots of friends in, in the room actually. It's great to see them. Especially fantastic to see those own the um, green green puppies. What is that? It's going to be cleaning more of it tomorrow. So, <laughs> so um, my name is Kevin Haig. Um, I've been in the NPD since 2008. Um, uh, I was just reflecting on the way I'm here uh, today, actually. That the last time I was here at Unity for a conference, I think it was. 1989, when I was uh, the co-chair uh, of the National Lesbian and Gay Conference that we held in that year. It was the um, first really big uh, conference um, for our communities. Um, and it was the first one since the world. I think there had been one in the late 70s. Um, and to come here today and, and to see such an amazing group of people um, uh, arrayed here, all from wonderful organisations, supported by the US Embassy. The US Embassy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have loved that sponsorship money back then. <laughs> um, and, and in those days, we were very much in the infancy of, of our political movement. Now here we are, a very mature political movement that has achieved a very great deal. Um, and it's exciting to be here in the room with you because I know that you are going to achieve a heck of a lot more still. So I look forward to your questions and great discussion here today. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Unity uh, and um, the ability for us to share this wonderful space. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Pride Trust and of course I'd like to acknowledge not only the US Embassy but Ambassador um, David Edna, who's no longer with us. I think that this legacy uh, program uh, that is led, which has enabled all of you, young aspiring leaders, to come from around the world, uh, actually creates a really good opportunity uh, for us to think about the type of country that we want to belong to. Uh, we belong to this wonderful place to in New Zealand. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do, and so the responsibility that we all have now in the room is to make New Zealand a better place. Uh, which is in fact what the bill that I promoted last year uh, with the help of Kevin, Tyron and my colleagues from right across the house was actually all about. It was making New Zealand a country that was firmly grounded in human rights principles of equality and non-discrimination and we did it in a way that took the public with us and so I guess that is the legacy of marriageability. Um, in terms of who I am, I'm the eldest of four children, born and bred in Topol. Uh, the wall is from County Tyrone, so my great 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 grandfather came out in 1862, one of five brothers, he married into a Māori family, and so I'm very proud to be, I think, a quintessential New Zealander, one who can uh, Papa from uh, our colonial, colonial heritage, um, but I'm also proudly, staunchly, Kama uh, Te proud to be Māori and also proud to belong to the Pacific. So mm -hmm. all of our Pacifica uh, whānau from Te Wanahui Aikiwa, uh, we sit proudly in this land uh, as, um, as the, the kaitiaki, the guardians. Um, I pretty much grew up in a family uh, where I was loved and actually uh, that has been the fundamental uh, the fundamental base for me to do whatever I've been able to do in my life. To be loved by your parents uh, and then to be supported to achieve the goals and aspirations you set yourself uh, has meant that I am pretty happy uh, about doing things that I believe are right. And nothing will deter me from uh, trying to achieve something that I believe is right, whether it be for Māori groups or Pacific groups or LGBTIQ groups 
or whatever. Um, the whole thing that I bring into politics, and I'm a fairly new politician. Um, I had a little bit of a stint in 2008 as a list MP, but at the last general election, I secured a Labour's nomination and the Manurewa electorate, and at the last general election, I became the MP for Manurewa. And so my career in politics will be one where um, inequality is actually the issue that I am most interested in. And when I look at the bill that I promoted, actually, uh, it was all about uh, identifying that there was an inequality in our system. We have a democratic system which means all of us are equal. And we are all equal. We're all equal human beings, we're all equal citizens. And so we have great opportunities uh, in our country to benefit not only ourselves, but actually live that principle of equality. So I look forward to this session. I look forward to hearing what hopefully will be a dynamic interactive one. I don't want us kind of just to sit up here and talk to you, but let's have a, have a conversation and um, think about the opportunity that we have as leaders here in Aotearoa today uh, to make our country the best place it can be. Here we go. Thank you. That's fantastic. And that, actually, interesting was what you just then mentioned brings us on to our very first um, pre prepared discussion point, which is marriage equality. And um, the reason that I was interested in asking this uh, particular question is, of course, because you know, the BNP is critically involved in helping this process. Um, Louisa, of course, um, sponsored the bill. So from the perspective of what we're here to discuss, what I'm interested in is um, how were you folks lobbied? How did the process work in terms of advocacy and lobbying and so on um, by people from both sides of the the argument and how effective were the so how effective were the people themselves when they were lobbying? I'm wondering if you have any. Um, Kevin, I can start with you. Do you have some thoughts on that? Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, can everyone hear me if I just speak in this term, please? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, we've received a lot of email. <laughs> <laughs> um, I sat on this. I sat on the select committee at Toyo, and uh, one of the things that I, I set out to do was uh, read all of the submissions that got made to the select committee. I didn't succeed in achieving that, but I, 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 I read a few thousand of them, um, and um, the things that really struck me about the ones that were effective were that they were from our side, they, they supported the bill. I guess I was going to see the reader <laughs> um, But more to the point, they, they came from a personal perspective. They said, um, they, they, they weren't focused on, here are all of the arguments for this bill, because actually I knew all of the arguments, and all of the MPs heard the arguments for, and the arguments against the times. But what really made a difference was um, this is how this bill will affect me if it becomes law. Is how I'm affected by the law as it is now that discriminates against me. Um, and that was very powerful, not only for me, but for persuading other MPs. And we certainly um, did some work pulling those together and making those available to all MPs regardless of the Committee. And speaking to the other members of the committee, both those who uh, ended up voting for the bill, but also those who opposed, those were the submissions that they found most powerful. Mm -hmm. um, we, we got a lot of other, other email. Um, the thing that I would say is that a lot of the email we received from opponents of the bill was kind of ineffective because it was just a form letter. It was just, here is the same text with the same subject line sent to you by a hundred different people. Um, now, uh, I don't know about you, but my response to that was to set up a rule in my email inbox with that subject line and just delivering it directly into a folder that I didn't even look at. Um, <laughs> So, so that was ineffective, but again, the personalised email telling the stories was incredibly useful. Um, 
I mean, if I could just um, sort of take a, a moment's indulgence, one of the things we ask people to do um, from the group that was just described already, to actually stand across political parties, um, was we, we identified some MPs that, that it would be useful for particular groups to go and see. Um, and some of you I know were involved in, in, in some of that work. And that was very, very important. And it sort of fits with this general idea that I have around how to go about achieving change. Figure out who's going to make the decision to achieve the change. Figure out what will influence that person. What, what will finally bring about that change that you want. Um, and then connect up the tactics that we use with, with those factors. So that we don't throw a picket and a march and you know, those, those usual, usual tactics at every problem. Because sometimes they'll be the right things to do, other times they'll be the wrong things to do. And the thing that was especially effective in this case was people be, being brave, telling their stories, um, and saying, I'm counting on you to stand up for my rights as a citizen of this country. Thank you. Um, Claudette, any, any thoughts? Well, I wasn't in the house at that stage because unfortunately for me, I have 53 plus grandchildren to cut. But um, I was working on live radio at the time and um, followed Melissa's problems really closely. And if there were issues that were brought up that I thought could be explored via Māori media around the religious question, I would invite um, some of our Rangatira from churches to discuss it uh, with me and um, or some other community groups, Māori Women's Welfare League. So although I wasn't in the house to lobby my colleagues, I did try as much as possible to follow the Rusa and to ensure that there was another platform and forum for our for particularly Māori to discuss their concerns or to promote the, uh, the positiveness of the bill. Interestingly, um, I am in the union uh, with my wife Nadine and we had three children. The Rusa is in the Silver, Silver Union and she might um, have changed her mind one the, 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 uh, the ability to get married, but apparently Melissa is not at this point in time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just leave it out there, just leave it out there. Um, but the other thing I think which is really relevant uh, to me is that while we have the Homosexual Law Reform Bill and the great work that was brought uh, to Parliament by our Parkour College, and the Marriage Equality Bill was also championed by our Parker College colleagues from me. And for some of the Māori that I talked to, but Kitty Carr is an example, if you know Kitty Carr, the significance of Louisa bringing this bill and finishing it off had resonated through a particular group of Māori to understand the importance of that bill, not in terms of tikanga Māori, Louisa isn't just from Tupanitoa. Louisa, her arapoto, comes from Paramount Chief. And on her Waikato Tainui side, her arapoto is also part of the Kahuyaraki, the, um, the um, now the Māori king. And so for this huge kaupapa that affects our whole nation and resonated worldwide, and I know that it's resonated worldwide with Murray, I'm sorry, Morris, oh, the Honourable Minister Morris Finlayson, who's the Minister of Buildings and all things like Watch Around Buildings, is still <laughs> trending on Twitter and still receiving uh, Twitters of congratulations on his speech. So we know that from Melissa bringing this, the significance of who she is and what she represents to tell Māori is, is very, very significant move. And so for that, um, you know, we acknowledge um, the tippy that Melissa is in bringing that co to the house. Mm -hmm. Lisa, you Sure. Um, I, I think in terms of the campaign, um, it was framed within a historical context of not only our progression um, from 1986 when we as a country went through homosexual law reform, 
um, and in the normalisation of our relationships. But it was also framed within the context of New Zealand giving the, you know, giving women the right to vote, first in their country in the world. Um, that we have been really progressive in terms of addressing our colonial history and engaging uh, with Māori and resolving the, the treaty settlement. So um, I think before um, we actually got into the battle of earnest, uh, there was a really solid platform um, of value uh, and values and beliefs that New Zealand has, but also concerted effort from our community to get to where we've got to, to then progress to, to the next level, which was really about, um, and the simplicity of the bill is very much about um, principles of equality and non-discrimination. So, you know, the institution of marriage is something that, um, that societies hold dear because it is through families that we have cohesive, solid uh, communities to build uh, and enable children to be reared. And that's actually how we get, um, you know, the best um, capacity of, our, of us as a society functioning. And um, so I believe the simplicity of the bill, uh, which was saying that marriage is between two people, uh, regardless of their sex, sexual orientation, or gender identity, was actually a really simple narrative that was easy to communicate with the people of New Zealand. Um, the reason the bill was so easy, I believe, was through collective effort. There was collective effort through the House, there was collective effort uh, with groups like Legalised Love, Campaign for Marriage Equality, I want to acknowledge um, Noah here today. It was through student unions, it was through the queer um, groups um, that uh, actually ended up becoming leaders within our community in terms of our public engagement. And then I think the strategy around a very intimate discussion and debate that Kevin talked about uh, really made what we were trying to communicate with New Zealand as real. It wasn't a kind of a theoretical thing. It was kind of a theoretical thing from one perspective because what we were pushing was normalisation. So as homosexual New Zealanders or non-heterosexual New Zealanders, we are normal human beings. We might be a minority uh, human beings in our country, but actually we, we're normal human beings. And then within the context of a democracy, which is how we go in our country, one person, one vote, we are equal citizens. Um, and so I think, from my perspective, because that message was so easy, um, it kind of resonated. Um, and then the other thing that we did was we were very clear that we were going to protect the right of uh, religious institutions to continue to define marriage for themselves, but it would be relevant to their context. So it was about having some reciprocity in terms of us valuing, um, respecting one another. And within a modern New Zealand society, we have uh, over 180 different ethnic groups, different cultures, different language, different beliefs. Um, it was actually also about us living harmoniously. And I, and I actually want to acknowledge the Human Rights Commission um, and the work that they've done to kind of sell that message about celebrating diversity and difference and that actually we shouldn't be threatened uh, by one another. Uh, actually there's lots of opportunities for us to look at the synergies between our culture and our language and, and actually I think really at the end of the day that's what New Zealand has shown to the rest of the world. We didn't have a lot of conflict. Um, but what I, what I want to acknowledge is particularly the youth voice around the country. I think that young New Zealanders really participated in this um, campaign more than any other piece of legislation. And it was your voices that I want to honour uh, in that discussion and dialogue. I mean, each of us had different roles. Kevin did a lot of work um, with the petitions and mobilising support and getting the submissions in, and we had a huge amount of um, people engaged in the process. I kind of had the national um, media dealing with the Colin Gray craves and the McCrossbreeds and all those types of things. <laughs> and then almost um, putting out fires, like the two big things that were going to derail the campaign were this focus on polygamy, that marriage equality somehow was going to lead to polygamy, um, and then the other issue was about children. You know, that by enabling um, same-sex married couples to join the adopt, somehow we were denying our children a mother and a father, and we kind of quickly you know, got over that through fact, actually. That's really what enabled us to challenge some of the um, propaganda that they were trying to to propagate on our community, you know, on society, it was through fact. 
Um, but yeah, I think um, from my perspective, it was a wonderful way uh, to enter Parliament <laughs> and to understand the system, actually walking through the process. But um, overall, it was through collective effort that we were able to achieve what we did. So thank you to all of you because we did that work. Thank you. Um, so we're going to open it up to the floor now. Um, sadly, we've only got half an hour, so hopefully we'll be able to get to some positive questions. So, who has a question? Uh, quite a lot in the focus groups we've been talking about education and kind of making changes towards uh, changing, you know, sexual education schools, typically in high schools. How do you uh, three think that we should go about supporting the big coordinators to develop kind of a new, more updated system? <laughs> I just want to stress this because I want to acknowledge our fire um, Felicia and all the great money that she does, not just in South Auckland, but with our um, training partner as well too. And we've got a, a lot of work to do and Felicia is driving that along with here and there and um, the people out in Māori family services. So, you know, um, sister, nā mihi kia kia koe, me takawa wha kia koe mo ki māori poke, kia oka. And I just want to um, pick up on that educational thing because you talked about um, going out to a different group. As you know, um, Minister Kay, the Minister of Youth Affairs, has just um, released $5,000 to ensure that there is a plan that is progressed uh, following all the research that's been done. And you know that you've been one of the research groups in the world, Tangata Whenua, are the most researched group for what happens after that. And so it is up to the community to ensure, via Rainbow Youth, Rainbow Youth, to ensure that those necessary groups who will implement the plan based around the research will take place. But my challenge to Rainbow Youth is to ensure that central to any of that is around our transgender farmer and in and around our Takatakwe whanau as well too. Because we are an integral part of that. And it, it is the end of, end of, end of. So do not forget about the range of whanau that make up the hapu, that make up the iwi, that is GLBTI. But I would emphasise that whatever Rainbow View chooses to do with their pūtia to ensure that Tangata Whenua is taken care of and our Pacific Art as well too, and particularly the work around our tradition. Uh, yeah, um, I, let's see, I think the, the issue you've touched on is one that's very important to me. Um, and you may know that I have a, um, a, a project that's been going now for a few years. This started with a report uh, called How Do We Make It Better, um, and which sprang from It Gets Better. You know, it's a, uh, sort of did a It Gets Better video, and then people were saying, well, all very well getting better in the future. We're going to make it better right now. And, uh, and so I commissioned a report on what are the things that could make it better right now. Um, and what we're doing now, so the follow up, is that we have taken a whole bunch of schools that, uh, I mean, one of the, the, the education area that you've raised is one of the main areas of recommendation. That we have. So we said, okay, let's now move to implement that. And the, the critical issue was there are some fantastic schools who are doing great things, but there are also many terrible schools who are doing nothing or next to nothing. Um, how can that be an acceptable result in a country that has a national education system and a national universal entitlement for citizens to have a good support of education? So what we've done is we've said, okay, well, the entity that has the job of ensuring consistency in the schools with standards is the Education Review Office. So what we've done is we've taken uh, all of the schools, the Education Review Office 
uh, as expected over a six month period. And we have gone back and, and, and gotten the material they provide at ERO, we've added in some supplementary questions about stuff that is outside of the stuff that the ERO is currently supposed to be uh, working on, and we're close now to publishing a report that, that is effectively an audit of ERO, saying how good a job is ERO doing of, of ensuring consistency, and it will be no surprise to you that <laughs> just a sneak preview. It's not doing a very good job at all. Um, but it's so, so we now have the evidence to prove that um, and to drive public policy change um, along those lines. So if there are groups coming out, spinning out of this conference that want to work on those issues, get in touch because we'd love to work with you on the point. So just to um, pick up from um, where Kevin left off, um, some of you have seen um, in November last year, um, back in the international conference, and so there's quite a big conversation happening at the moment around how do we um, actually create really resilient young people. Mm -hmm. So how do we start really early and teach children how to respect themselves, how to respect mm -hmm. other people, uh, and actually to be able to interact with one another in a really healthy, positive way. And at least we can start that journey really early. Uh, it makes it difficult um, later in life when you're going through um, hormones and the transition from having friendships to engaging in sexual activity. And so when I met with Jackie um, just before Christmas, um, family planning have got the tools and the resources. And I think part of what Kevin has picked up on is that actually we need a responsive education system that is going to enable us to start having these conversations with children as soon as they enter the education system. Um, I think that it's something that we, we can achieve, and obviously it will be something that we will uh, be able to engage with the sector with. But I guess the contrast to um, um, and, and to the how receptive boards of trustees, families and communities are going to be uh, about what we're trying to achieve um, will be, I guess, some of the um, media sensationalism around it, saying that we're going to teach kids about sex and sexuality, that's five-year-olds. Um, but I think um, we've got the content to be able to go out and, um, and have these um, engaging conversations, which includes um, the ability of young people to know uh, that how they express themselves, whatever it might be, um, whether they be all the different terms that we have, LGBTIQ, I only mean, what Q was by the Human Rights Report, which is questioning. So how do we, how do we enable our young people um, to be who they are in a safe and supportive and nurturing way? That's what I'm really saying. Um, some of the evidence um, and uh, information that we are all worried about is members of parliament around the high rates of abortion we have, the sexually transmitted infections, you know, the numbers of DPV recipients. We've got, you know, young people really, unless we engage really early, uh, we've got big problems. But in some communities, we can't talk about sex, we can't talk about how we keep young people safe. You know, we want to, for example, enable young people to have access to condoms. How can, how can we do that in a safe way? And with, and at all the time, bringing communities with us. And where I'm from in South Auckland, you know, we've got um, a, 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 this highly concentrated um, church groups <coughs> where they believe that young people aren't engaging in sexual activity. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do. And you're right, people like um, um, Felicia and other leaders in our community uh, being able to work with our youth, but I think at the same time work with our, our Pacific and Māori leaders and other community leaders um, about um, how we keep our young people safe um, is kind of the biggest challenge that we're facing at the moment, I believe. But um, from my perspective, we need to start early and implement it through our, uh, our public education system so that young people actually have the skills and the tools as they grow to be able to negotiate what is a you know, normal, natural uh, life process. So. Thank you. Next.
perseverance. Um, this is not a question for the book or death, but um, I'm kind of interested in how you reconcile being a member of the National Party, which is a history <laughs> on anti um, as a history of homophobia, and then saying your position as an LGBT activist. And I know there are people like the Lord Kevin and the Catholic and such and similar sides to the spectrum that reconcile that, but I'm curious how you do it. Mm-hmm. This is a question that, um, that I've asked. Um, the John Healy National Government in 2011 to 2014 is not the same national lead government by Rob Morton. And, and I'm sure that this is going to be a question that's been, that will be brought up earlier, but I'll just jump straight to it because you, you've raised it. Um, Kaori Aho. I cannot see a lot of Māori here. I can see our Pacifica brothers and sisters and our Tauriki from around New Zealand. And this is about leadership, and I'm wondering where the leadership of our new. GLBTI community are, uh, you'd also eat there, our Māori, in the Māori world. So I'll tell you who they are. They were leading the no mining, no drilling hikoi to Waitangi. They were signing the Ngāti Kuri Treaty Settlement. They are running the Pōhanga on Māori. They are ensuring that there are healthy, warm homes being set up in their Pōhanga, in their Pōhanga. So, in terms of Te Ao Māori, and I'm sure um, by Elizabeth would have talked about it as well too, we, the Māori community, just connected from the gay community back in, through, from 1975 through the 80s. Our vision was around Māori, our language, our land, our whana. And our leaders, Miriam Fitman, Professor Nahui, Nahui Ateo Kōtuku, um, Dangi Tūnō Black, went there, over there, to work on Te Ao Māori and our language land and our whānau. And that is where our Takatāpui leaders of my generation are, and that is where they are today. They are leading land marches, they're signing treaty settlements, they're working in social welfare, they're building businesses. And, and uh, the point is, we are there because of a national lead government, a John Key lead national government, who have looked at Maori and decided that $1.6 billion of treaty settlements is where Maori want to go. And for return of that, $35 billion to the GDP in terms of business, social sustainability um, around social welfare. So it is not an easy, um, it is, it, it's, there are a whole new myriad of reasons why um, Takatāpui, a very open lesbian, will join the National Party. And it's because my focus is on Kūpapa Māori, of which Takatāpui is a part of my world. But make no mistake about it, for our leaders in my generation, our focus is on Māori as Tangata Whenua, our focus is on Pacifica as our Fano Manuiatiwa, and in that Fano we are Takatā. And so uh, that is why it is necessary for us to join those countries who we resonate with us in terms of our aspirations. That's not to say that Labour is not here for us. They are, the Green Party are, we must be everywhere. And I think that is the point that Melissa is making as well too in terms of make sure you're everywhere, make sure you're lobbying in every corner, make sure that you are not, you do not have just one avenue to go to. You must, in terms um, of um, accessibility, go everywhere, be everywhere, talk to everyone.
Thank you for that. I think we'll move on, but I just wanted to make one um, little comment that um, it was under a national government that the Human Rights Act changed its name. Catherine O'Regan was a minister at the time, and so the anti discrimination legislation came up. Thankfully, under a national government. Thanks. Can I also say about the homosexual law reform bill? It. it was the national government that held it up so that the Labour colleagues could come into vote for that because we had, there was too much opposition in the House across the party. The national party held it up so that it could be voted on. We don't want to get into too much part of politics, so I'd like to shift them on if we've got some questions. Uh, yep, in the red cards. Um, so, uh, going back to uh, the convention now, and the schools, you spoke about education, but we actually want to do to make schools safe. The schools aren't safe as it is. There's no need to use the bathroom. Transgender kids have to be put into a school camp that aren't the right students. And, uh, all these sort of things are also applied up to education statistics, but what if it does not say? Yeah, no, that, that's a really valid question. Um, in fact, last year I had um, two students who um, began at school as uh, boys and they wanted to be girls, and um, working with the counsellors at that school. Principal and Board of Trustees um, was really challenging. Um, in both instances, uh, the school accepted the gender that the young person had chosen, but you're absolutely right about uh, what facilities are available um, within schools. It's very gender based, so you have boys or girls changing rooms, you don't have uh, unisex, uh, so that actually you can choose to go wherever you want. Um, it's going to be a, a, an ongoing um, process of engagement. Um, we do that as, as individual MPs in our electorates by talking to uh, our principals. So none of the schools in my electorate have any issue about same-sex um, couples or partners going to school boards. So we don't have a problem, believe it or not, in South Auckland about that. Um, the principals didn't have a problem about these young people um, choosing uh, you know, how they wanted to be um, at school. But it, it, it caused huge issues for some of the staff. So how do we go about it? I think we've got to do some of the systemic things that Kevin talked about and actually make it part of the narrow process with schools are actually uh, held accountable for not creating those safe spaces. But the way that I like to engage is to talk, you know, with my with the leaders within the school. Um, and this the young the young person um, particularly that I um, was asked to come on and, and talk to him, he had been rejected by his family. It was really complicated. He was having counselling sessions and, and I think that's the other part is making sure uh, that the resources uh, need to be available so that we can take not only the young person but their family and the school through a whole lot of, you know, um, it, it's changing of thinking, it's affinity. I mean, there's a launch um, on the 17th, I think, of the TIC, the Rainbow TIC, which is um, going to be, um, you know, every Probably we should start with schools actually. Schools go through these competency training so that they make sure that the environment is safe for, safe for our kids. And maybe, you know, we're, we're at the beginning of that, that process. Our job is how do we uh, make it a systemic response so that we can guarantee that every child. And, but I think we're on the right track in terms of the ERO and the auditor. And the, yeah. But it's also about walking with all the trustees and communities. I don't think we can just, as a government, say you're going to do this and think that that's the solution. It's not. So, yeah. uh, the, I, think, I think the thing I'd add is that, as you, you, you may well know, that schools already have a requirement to provide a safe environment for them and their students. Mm -hmm. um, so, if that environment doesn't exist, and absolutely right, it doesn't exist in many schools. The schools are failing to meet or something that is already a requirement. Um, now that, that is uh, one of the main threats. The safety issue is one of the main threats that our Aero project is is picking up on. Um, but it also means that if there 
if there, if there was a group around a particular school who wanted to challenge the school's performance, that there would be an extremely sound legal basis to do that. Um, and again, I'd be very pleased to work with a group to, to achieve that. Well, I think um, one of the reasons why it hasn't happened is because, you know, the Minister of Education, she's got no idea. Mm -hmm. She hasn't been told. And I think this is why it's really critical that the community, um, particularly around um, led by Felicia and uh, Tarani, go to the challenge. You know, so it's all very well for the schools to fight against it. But at the end of the day, if the minister doesn't say do it, they ain't gonna do much about it. And, um, but again, I do say that the Ministry of Education um, does have a role, critical role to play in this, and it is about lobbying the Ministry of Education to ensure that the Taki gets faith on the table. And I'm very open to uh, taking that tunnel, a little bit of tunnel, tunnel, to take that to the Minister and laying it down on the table. But again, can I just emphasise this? It, um, when you are working with a Minister who is mine, it must come from the community in which it's total, which it is impacting on the most. Thank you. Um, we've got we said to you last year, we were going to be the education programs in school, and how do we get to this? So, the incredible ability that the well, again, my point was um, it would be really interesting to see how far up the table it got through the ministry and the advisors from the ministry. And the speaker, it's a big organisation. And maybe I'm going to go speak about the Iraq Age of this. We've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm wondering if we can try and contract our answers. Um, some questions over here? Yes. I would like to um, start a discussion on the Iranian politician. So this is a broad. So for the little part in that festival of drama, the Jewish politicians include young people, the young people of LGBTQ are specific in particular in your current democratic elections in 2014. And on that separate note, what about the promotion of enhancing of the LGBTQI community in terms of gender expression measures? Okay, big question. Um, for the Green Party, uh, our, all of our policy is developed by all of our members. Um, so, uh, so it's not the MPs, it's not the politicians who develop our policy, it's the members of our, our party. And we have um, the, the, a group called the Rainbow Greens, who are our LGBTIQ uh, Green Party members who would take the lead in developing our policy. So as an MP, I can suggest that we, that we have some new policies, um, but it's up to the members of the party to develop that policy. I think that policy is pretty good. Um, so from our point of view, uh, we, we believe in total, total equality without, having to, without anyone having to compromise who they are. I would hesitate to say that what we can do with this policy is going to be the right policy for you in Fiji, um, because the right policy for you will be depending on the context that you're working in, and it's really important that you develop that rather than uh, it being developed by anyone else and imposed, imposed in Fiji. Um, on the other hand, if you if you want some help in developing good policy, we're very happy to to be a partner in that. So that's only part of your question, I know, but I'm conscious that I'm closest to that. Uh, yeah, within this <laughs> slack. <laughs> I'll try and be quick. Um, Labor's had a, um, a rainbow Labor set, uh, set this since 1986, and we elect somebody who represents us on a national council. Uh, we have a specific manifesto commitment to rainbow issues. Uh, we have a rainbow caucus, I'm the rainbow chair. 
uh, we prioritise legislation, so marriage and adoption equality where our priority is going into the last election. Uh, for us, there are still issues about uh, any gender identity to Section 21 of the Human Rights Act to make the ground of non discrimination. So, um, within our party, we are very uh, proactive and we don't have a quota as such, but actually, we're probably overrepresented. Uh, there's four of us who are out, and some of you will see a flyer, uh, and we're likely to have more rainbow candidates at the next general election. Um, so, um, from the Labour Party perspective, um, equality under the law is absolutely what we strive for and I guess the challenge that we have is how do we make the, the state system accountable to doing exactly what you said, making sure that all of us um, are able to be who we are in a safe and supported way uh, and that in environments where our needs aren't being met, how do we hold them accountable? I'm not sure how, um, what it would look like and so I wouldn't be able to give a A or an A because I'd be interested to see how that actually looks and you know what it looks like. Do you have a second? Hi. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, but I know this is a youth forum and I'm an elder. Um, I'd like to ask maybe from your perspective, particularly for our Pacific LGBTQI community, what I want our youth to hear because often our Pacific MPs who are out there don't really support our Pacific LGBTQI community and I want you to offer them advice around how they can access um, these MPs who don't support us So, what are the right channels for them to be able to have a voice, to have representation, to be heard and to be continue to be seen because they're missed out and I'd just like to acknowledge each and every one of you for, for everything that you do but it would be awesome to have you give some good advice to our Pacific LGBTQI people around those pathways moving forward? Yeah, I think that's a um, really critical question because the Minister of Pacific Affairs now is um, their centre family winger and, um, and he didn't vote for it, he voted against the legislation, so did um, our, my other colleague, um, Alfred Nardin. And of course we know that the Pacific community know that they, they are Christian and um, so that is the perspective that they were coming from. I think, I'm going back to the question about my national, there is a particular way to talk to all my colleagues and it is around economic development. So although these are very much a human rights issue and they are issues around equality, it's horses for horses and corridor for tarima. And so um, it is incumbent upon me to ensure that if you want to be in the front of the minister, regardless of whether it's here, but I've been very um, um, supportive of the queer community. And so the fact that she um, has not come back around that report signals to me immediately that there is a gatekeeper not wanting you to see it. And so we get that, you know, we get a lot of that. And so, um, but again, it is up to us to talk to these people in a particular manner to get through the door in order to lay down our I, I was just going to say, I think that actually there is a really good opportunity with Pacifico San Bushlinga being um, the new Minister of Youth Affairs. I mean, I think there's a really good opportunity for young LGBT youth, particularly Pacific youth, to ask to see who uh, be very clear about, um, I guess, what, what you want to achieve from going to see them. And if it is about him knowing and understanding the circumstances that um, some of our young people are, uh, are currently experiencing um, and what you want him to do about it, then he now has an opportunity to, to change the system that we've been talking about. Um, I think it's ideal to get in and see him really soon, um, introduce yourself and have an ongoing dialogue with them. In terms of the broader um, Pacific, um, I would make it more uh, geography focused, so I would invite a whole lot of South Auckland MPs together actually and talk about what the issues are, broader issues around, you know, what are our issues um, of concern for our families in terms of our family violence issues, um, issues at school that can be very specific to some schools, you know, and come with issues that you want us to help, um, to help you um, work with. Um, but yeah, really don't stop trying to engage and actually make it a regular uh, kind of engagement. Um, 
we will come if you invite us to Italy. And, you know, if you can't get the Pacific members, um, I will always come. Claudette will always come, Kevin will always come, and we will try and influence our colleagues. So that's the other way to get the message uh, to Pacific members of Parliament. I think the only thing that I'd add is to go back to that point that I made with the right of the pandemic about how to call it, which is if you're trying to, trying to achieve a particular goal, you think about who, who it is that will make that decision or take the action that you want. You think about all of the factors that will, that will, that will influence that person. Not only the rules, you know, the formal requirements that they're supposed to take into account, but also the so who are the people or the organisations that are really influential in, in shaping that person's actions? Uh, one of the things that all of us as politicians will, will be influenced by is where we think the votes are. You know, are, am I going to win votes or lose votes by that? So, uh, so if you're trying to influence a particular uh, member of parliament or, or minister, um, Actually, regardless of whether they're a Pacifica um, or anyone else, is to think about those those influences. How can I have an impact on those things? So, for example, one of the things I would try to do um, if I were trying to influence um, one of our um, Pacifica colleagues would be to think, okay, well, who are the more progressive forces within? Uh, the Pacifica churches who might be able to have an impact on that person. So I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing you know, I would suggest. And I'm always, uh, as we will, uh, I'm sure, prepared to help with the planning process of brand development strategy. Just one last thing though, um, you know, I mean, strategy is going to be like a range of things, but at the end of the day, for our Māori and Pacifica MPs, they um, we'd also eat that, you know, eat our Māori. They must be accountable to us because they are our whānau members, regardless of whether they, um, whether we like what they are doing or not. You don't, you, you should not even have to take to them a particular tucky. You just need to get, they need to come to the community to um, tell you what it is that they are about. And demanding that they front up and present themselves to the whānau is critical. And so, and so my challenge to the Pacifico community is to demand that they front because we did. No. We've been granted another 15 minutes, which I think maybe we can squeeze two more questions in. One just behind there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Louisa, I kind of disagree that um, polygamy isn't the next step after gay marriage, and I wonder whether you think polygamy. Um, I didn't say that. Sorry, I could have said at the beginning that one of the arguments was uh, against it was uh, the fact that people thought polygamy was um, the next. I specifically yeah. said that by New Zealand enabling marriage equality, we were then going to enable polygamy. And I guess my question is why shouldn't we? And if that argument wasn't used against uh, marriage equality, would you have included that in the bill at the time? No, and actually it was one of the challenges that young people particularly um, gave. One, one was I should make, or we should make, um, churches and um, religious celebrates perform same-sex marriage against the belief. And the other was that, yeah, why were we women who married to two people? Um, and in our society, and actually mostly across the world, um, marriage is an institution between two people. Um, that is how you found the family. Um, these progressive relationships, and I acknowledge that they exist, um, is not for this time. It might be for another time and another MP, but it wasn't for me. Cool. Any other questions? Behind, yeah. Uh, you have to... um, kia ora, uh, I want to acknowledge your meeting and all your great efforts uh, and being such good role models for two of you. Um, I, I did a literature review um, on gay Maori, uh, sorry, queer Aboriginal youth suicide in Australia and New Zealand. 
Um, and one of the challenges I faced was there's not enough research done on a double minority, one, uh, on gay and uh, indigenous. Um, so, and I think the effects, we were talking in uh, workshops before about the effects of colonization uh, on uh, Maori and Pacific people and how colonial uh, morality in terms of sexuality has affected uh, our people and, and the suicide rates uh, accordingly are much higher for Maori and Pacific people and obviously much higher for gay people, but if you combine them both, um, but I think the root cause is institutional homophobia and institutional racism play a part. Um, and, and so my question is kind of long winded, but uh, the, it's about the uh, de, jure, de jure and de facto gap. There's a gap between the law, the equality under the law, and the equality in practice. Um, and my solution, which I'm going to give, and you can comment on it, is to have a. <laughs> <laughs> Within the government, who can collaborate with the other government institutions and have uh, you know some sort of checks and balances and making sure that all the different government institutions, like the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Justice, um, Ministry of Queer Affairs, <laughs> uh, so that uh, you know uh, both uh, gay, lesbian, uh, Takatakwe, uh, trans, all those issues. Uh, are uh, are encompassed and that they are uh, part of uh, attacking institutional homophobia and racism um, so that we can see uh, reduction in uh, these suicide rates and that uh, our children, uh, and, uh, I know some of the uh, kids that go to school uh, uh, that have transgender parents who get bullied and they go to the school board, board and complain but they get you know, home, institutional homophobia from the school board. And you were talking about Hekia Parada, but I, yeah, I just wanted to... Can I, you, sorry, can I just interrupt you there? I think you've outlaid quite well. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, well, these, these folks respond. So a, a rainbow ministry, I guess, is the potential. Any thoughts? Yeah, well, I'll start. Um, so I was in Brussels in November, and actually, um, we have a human rights, UN Human Rights Commission, and the big talk, talk globally is actually we should have a specific LGBTI uh, group that does exactly what you said. So um, I guess the New Zealand context, um, you know, is it sufficiently resourced within the Human Rights Commission? Uh, would be um, my question. Um, and if we think that we need a specific um, organisation, um, yeah, I mean, it's not part of our, of our planning, but um, presumably it would have to sit in justice. Um, but I don't know, actually, Jack, Jack's here, he might be able to answer it. And I know he's got, well, that's a designation within the Human Rights Commission, but really it's about capacity and then making sure we've got the resources yeah. to do the audits and then make the corrections when we yeah. come yeah. All, all well, yeah. get Throw some money about LGBT suicide, but it's an institutional like going through all three sectors and spectrums. So I agree with that's that. why I thought. Yeah. So, um, Claudette and uh, Kevin, any thoughts? Yeah, so such a big, you know, topic is that one. Can I just um, ask you, you know, do, do you think about um, the story, our quintessential queer, alter, or resilient story? Um, because I'm getting, I'm getting really like bamboozled with the audience you know, the other you know, the child, 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 Absolutely true, which is why, uh, what, which is one of the reasons why Māori are uh, back in the Hokanga doing the, you know, anti mining, decoy, the treaty center, all that kind of thing, because they're going back to to reaffirm, claim, reclaim, and um, entrench their place in their Bano Hapu and And if we bring any type of 
true to any of the ministers, then we have to know our whakapapa as well too, as the queer Aotearoa New Zealand um, community. As an example, Ota, Rob, do we know the story about Ota? Rob. So, but we know the story about, um, you know, our Tiara Wafano, the one that played the flute, and then the most time, we know that, right? Yes, we know that story. Okay, well, do you know the story about this creek bed around here that runs around the way to Wild and out to the harbour? Very significant places these are for the Takatapu community, hugely significant. And so, why, again, so my point is that a lot of our Takatapu youth, our Takatapu family, very revered in their time. Some were even taller than and then we lost that, those stories. We lost that whakapapa through a whole range of colonisation, Christianity, even rapid as another form of Christianity, with our mind boys books, that kind of thing. So um, it is reframing and refocusing absolutely globally, must have, but also coming back to ourselves and reclaiming ourselves Just briefly, on, on your question, um, I think there potentially are some things that a Ministry of Queer Affairs um, could accomplish, but um, most, of, most of the problems that you set out in, in your question are not things that, that a Ministry would be the solution to. So if you think about, um, we have uh, Tukuni Koke, um, has that eliminated racism against Mara? Has it actually even made much of a dent in racism against Mara? That's not really what it's about. The Ministry of Women's Affairs they, you know, has achieved some good things, but not really tackled sexism. And, and so, uh, always, I would, I would say, start with problem definition and then figure out what the solution to that, the structural solution is to that problem. Um, rather than start with the structure and and hope that it will that it will work. Um, so, so yeah, we could do some things, but not a particular issue. Not that gap between the two and de facto that you that you set out really well. So one final question. I do have a legislative priority and it would be to add um, gender identity as a ground of non-discrimination and I will be doing all that I can uh, to achieve that now. Actually, I'm not waiting until we have the government, I'm going to be doing work on that now. Um, the other 
priority in addition to what Kevin said and, and um, we were on the Health Select Committee together so a lot of the priorities in the Health um, Inquiry report we have absolute synergy on. But I do have um, a passion about the Pacific um, and I'd like to see homosexual law in the Pacific. Um, so if I had an international um, commitment it would be to do that. Not marriage equality actually but homosexual law reform. Um, and I also am passionate about marriage equality and I will be uh, doing all I can to help um, advance the agenda in Australia. So I'm going to Madagra and I'll be um, talking at a few political forums over there and trying to get Abbott to agree to a conscience vote. <laughs> so if that, if that happens, then I'll be really happy. Um, but more than anything, um, it's just the responsibility that we, that we have as Rainbow members of Parliament to continually you know, re reinforce the normality of us in that space and to continue to engage with young people such as yourself um, in whatever campaigns and passions that you're involved with. So a lot of what we will do this year and next, actually, it's for you to determine and to come to us. I just was at a forum that Jack and Marnie um, chaired and I know that you are all signing this petition um, for the health inquiry. It's, yeah, it's these types of initiatives actually that have been part of our work. So what we do, it's up to you. And then something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got to agree with you, so I'm not going to talk to you anything. Absolutely nothing. But what I'm going to commit to do is if there is something that you want, and I would be able to take it from the room, it's not my place to tell you what you want, what you should have, where you should go. But if there is anything that you you specifically think is um, will develop and enhance the community and all of New Zealand, then that's the tucky that I will promote. Having said that, I am very concerned around the um, legalisation of prostitution and how that's affecting our bar and the streets in South Auckland around Mangere, Papatoi. Um, so I'm um, looking at that as well to see whether or not that has negatively impacted on our trade funds or working um, on those issues. So, would you be criminalising in that area? Sorry? Would you be promoting decriminalisation if we can tackle them? Well, you know what? I'll do what police are Thank you.